Well, guys, it's great to be back with you, and we're talking about killing kryptonite, and uh, we're on lesson two. Yes. And so we kind of opened up a can of worms at the end of the last lesson, and I think I better go back into it, right? Yeah, so yeah. Paul's addressing this weakness, right, this kryptonite yes. with the Corinthian church, and I'm going to go into the full body of what he says here. So in 1 Corinthians 11, in the 28th through 30th verse, he says, You should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ... Now, another translation says, without discerning the Lord's body, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourselves. He's talking to the church, okay? Yeah. This is the Corinthian church, yeah. all right? And then he says, that is why many of you are weak, sick, and some have even died, died prematurely. This is a very serious subject. And as I said in the um, last session, Sometimes I think we avoid things like this, and we shouldn't. I mean, this is in the Bible for a reason. This is in the New Testament for a reason. Now, let me just first of all start out by saying this. Paul's addressing specific behavior here on this Corinthian church, okay? But a lot of people, what they've done is they've limited the consequence to just the specific behavior. In other words, there's, there's something much deeper than just drinking the grape juice and eating the bread here that we're talking about. Yeah. It's what's behind what we're, they're doing that helps identify the spiritual kryptonite. Now, first of all, let's look at that word weak. I brought this up quickly last time. I want to bring it up again. It is the Greek word of which I refuse to pronounce because I don't want any Greek speaking people to be upset with me. But it means, to, it means the lack of strength, robustness, or being impotent and powerless. Now, when you hear statements like this, you kind of go, ah, wait a minute, for this reason, God's judgment, all this. Can I, can, can, I, can I just present it to you like this? Can you imagine if a doctor diagnosed a small tumor in a man and the doctor didn't want to give him bad news? And he's like, oh, it'll be a bummer. It'll ruin his day. And so the doctor, instead of saying, hey, you have a small tumor, we can remove it with a simple procedure. The doctor goes, you know what, you're doing great. Your life is wonderful. Enjoy your wife and kids. You know, keep playing sports, get an exercise, eat healthy. Well, what's going to happen two years later? This guy's going to die. Yeah. Of this one small tumor is now going to be inoperable. Right. So was it true love that the doctor avoided telling the guy bad news? No. That's the way Paul is with this church, wow. okay? Yeah. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. So he's saying, here's the cause for the, the weakness, the kryptonite. Remember the kryptonite neutralized Superman? Yeah. What he's talking about here is neutralizing this whole church, okay? David, King David, mm -hmm. you know, and, and let me just get down to what we're talking about here. It's called known sin is what we're discussing. Yeah. This is what these guys were doing. Okay. It wasn't just the fact about the grape juice. People have limited to just taking communion. Right. It's known sin. And, and I'm going to take time this lesson and next to develop it. But David, there was a time when he didn't repent of his known sin. And if you listen to what he says, he says in Psalm 32, my strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Wow. Now look at that. My strength's gone. Mm -hmm. He's, in, in the Message Bible, it says, all the juices of my life dried up wow. because of not addressing sin, disobedience to God. In another psalm, Psalm 3110, David says, sin has drained my strength. Mm -hmm. What did kryptonite do to Superman? It drained strength. his otherworldly powers, yeah. his strength, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. All right? So I want a strong word of caution here, and this is really important that you guys hear what I'm about to say, okay? Paul does not say this is the cause for any weakness, sickness, or premature death among you. Okay, why doesn't he write that? Because we live in a fallen world, and there's attacks. In other words, there's people sick, there's people that die prematurely, there's people that are going through struggles as far as their strength goes, not because of sin. It's because we live in a fallen world, and there are attacks. Are you with me? Do you remember the disciples said to Jesus, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? Remember that? So what does Jesus do? He rapidly and decisively cuts off this horrible mindset of these apostles. 
He said, hey, this man didn't sin, nor did his parents sin. This happened so the glory of God could be revealed, right? Yeah. right. But then on the flip side, okay, you got to remember the guy that had the 38-year infirmity that Jesus healed, right, at the yeah. pool of Bethesda. Yeah. What does Jesus say to him? He says, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Wow. So that's the flip side. Yeah. There is consequences to sin. Yeah. All right, are you following me? Yeah. So I remember when I was a young Christian, this is way back in the early 80s, uh, there was this horrible, horrible teaching that would go around in some circles that, oh, if somebody was having problems in life or if they were sick, if they were weak, they had sin. They obviously had hidden sin in their life. Yeah. I'm telling you, that is so upsetting to the heart of God. I mean, God must get so angry at yeah. that. And good leadership and great biblical teaching has eliminated that. There's still some of that around. So I just want to really make sure that we understand. Paul doesn't say this is the cause for any sickness, yeah. weakness, yeah. all right? right. Yeah. But we do have a situation where Jesus is saying, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Paul's dealing with the same thing here with this church. Mm -hmm. In other words, this church is suffering consequences yeah. because of their behavior. And that's what we want to deal with. And I, 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 I really want to say this. We really lack true love if we don't address this. Wow. Okay? I mean, let's go back to the doctor example. Did that doctor truly care about that patient by not revealing what was going to cause death, premature death in that man? No, that's a lack of love. If you look at Paul, Paul loved this Corinthian church. He loved it passionately. He says in 2 Corinthians 2, 4, he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand, the guy that wrote these words that says this is the reason you're under God's judgment is the guy that says I so passionately love you. You want to know why? Because God so passionately loves them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Absolutely. So when you hear the word judgment, mm -hmm. you can't be thinking, you know, hell, fire, and brimstone. Yeah, yeah. Judgment That's means good. decision. Yeah. God had made That's a decision good. to do something here, and that was to pull back in an area, okay? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah. Paul says to this Corinthian church, he said, I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. Mm -hmm. So what Paul's saying is, because I do love you so much, and I do tell you the truth, yeah. you think that I don't love you. You don't love me. You get angry with me. You'd rather have guys come and flatter you. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? I remember there was a time in my life when I was known as the kindest, most loving man in the entire church. This is way back in the mid-'80s. I, I was working for an 8,000-member church. We had about 300 people on our team, and uh, actually it got up to 450 at one point. And the, I'd heard it through the grapevine, you know, hey, hey, John Bevere is the most loving guy in the church, and I, I'm reveling in that, right? Yeah. So one day I'm in prayer, and the Holy Spirit says to me, he says, People say that you're the most kind and loving man in the church, don't they? And I said, yeah, they do. Now, you know how when the Holy Spirit says something to you like that, you can tell this is not going in a good direction, right? <laughs> okay. And, uh, well, actually, ultimately, it's for good. And I remember saying, yeah, they say that. He said, well, you really don't love them. Mm. I said, what? Wow. He said, John, do you want to know why you tell people nice things, only nice things, even if it's not true? I said, why? He said, because you fear their rejection. Mm. So he said, who's the focus of your love? You are. Wow. Yeah. And I went, oh, my, my. Mm. He said, if you really love people, you would tell them the truth they needed so that they could improve in life. Wow. That's what Paul's doing here. So then what happened was I swung the pendulum. Now I became hard, harsh, and for years I was like this. And I remember in 2001 I had done a European conference, and this guy said that I beat the sheep. And to be honest with you, he was right. Wow. And I heard from three different continents John Bevere beats the sheep. And it cut off some large meetings that I, I was about to be invited to. Wow. And I remember it caused me to start praying like I've never prayed before. Mm -hmm. I said, God, fill me with compassion. Yeah. And I, I remember after that, years later, I went to a church that I hadn't been to in five years since before this incident in 2001. And the pastor mm -hmm. said, John, your message hasn't changed, but the compassion oozes wow. out of you. Wow. And you know, when I wrote this book, I, want, I wanted to stop writing this book like six or seven times wow. because it's so strong, the message. Mm. And, and, and you know what the Holy Spirit kept saying? No, no, no. Every time I went to stop, well, it's addressing issues with me, and I'm thinking, Lord, it's strong. But you know what I realized? If I really love people, I got I to gotta, I gotta release the truth. 
And that's what Paul's doing with this church, okay? So let's go back to what he's saying. He said, you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many, now remember the word many, guys, of you are weak, sick, and some have even died. Now, it would have been much easier to swallow if Paul said, for this reason, some of you. But Paul specifically says many of you, okay? So here's what we got to realize. Paul's not speaking to individuals. He's speaking to this whole body, this church, the church at Corinth, okay? To really understand chapter 11, you have to go back to chapter 10. If you go back to chapter 10, Paul makes a statement. He said, these things happened to Israel. He's talking about Israel now. As examples for us, they were written down to warn us who live in the end of the age. So Paul's not just giving a history lesson here in, in chapter 10. He's giving us an illustration that warn us for today, okay? He opens up this chapter 10 with all of them, all of them followed the Spirit of God, the cloud. All of them were delivered from Egypt, which is a type of the world. All of them were baptized. All of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them, right, drank the same spiritual drink. So the emphasis here is all, 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 all. In other words, he's referring to one body. Do we see that? Yeah. So then he says in 1 Corinthians 10, remember I'm a chapter earlier. He says, and though we are many, we eat from one loaf. Uh-oh, he's talking about communion again, Right? Now, now, let me just say this. Their communion and our communion are totally different. Our communion is more of a ceremony. Their communion was an actual meal, okay? okay? So we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Yes. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? So the whole emphasis here in 10 and 11 is about being one body. Do you yeah. see this? Yeah. All right. So the bigger picture here is that the Corinth church didn't discern the Lord's body. So I want to read this to you. Was the judgment of the weak, sick, and dying prematurely directly assigned to each individual who was sinning, or was the body of Christ in Corinth as a whole suffering these consequences due to the behavior of some of its members? So this is what we're going to ask, okay? Now, that's a pretty big ask, but we need to stay with me, okay? In order to illustrate this, let's go back to what Paul was talking about, except let's go forward one generation to Joshua's generation. He was talking about Moses delivering them out of Egypt. Let's move to Joshua now, okay? When they crossed the Jordan, the first city they attacked was Jericho, right? Yeah. Now, Jericho was a massive city. It was the city where the spies came back and said, there's no way. It was one of the cities they saw that said, there's no way. Their giants were grasshoppers, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a massive fortified city, right? Yeah. But yet they go and they literally destroy that city and there's not one Israelite killed or injured. And they completely destroy it, okay? But now, listen to this. Before they went to Jericho, God made this, he gave, he gave his word on this, okay? He said, Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Don't take any of the things set apart for destruction. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. So God gives this command. Hey, Jericho's mine, it's first fruits. Everything that's worth value goes into the treasury of the Lord, right? So now, Israel destroys Jericho. Nobody's injured, nobody's wounded. The next city they, uh, they go into is Ai. All right? Now, before they go into Ai, we get a little inside commentary, okay? Because it says in Joshua 7, 1, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart from the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with Israelites. Now, do you notice it doesn't say, but Achan violated the instructions of the Lord. It said Israel did it. Mm. Yeah. And do you notice that God's very angry with Israel, not just with Achan? Yeah. Why? Because they're one body. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Oh. I mean, if my fist slugs you, you're not going to be mad at my fist and say, fist, I'm mad at you. Yeah. Right? Right. You're going to be mad at me. Yeah. Right? 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 Yeah. We're one body. we got to remember this. Wow. We being many wow. members, we are one body of Christ. Mm. I mean, hey, when you girls go in and get a spa treatment and they're giving you a scalp massage, your whole body enjoys it, right? Yeah. Right? If you cut your finger, your whole body doesn't like it. Somebody right. gets the flu. They, 
their whole body, right? Yeah. Because we're, so God doesn't say a man, a maker, and he says Israel. Wow. Okay? Now, they go into Ai and they say, hey, this is just a little town. Let's just send 3,000 warriors, right? And I've got that in Joshua chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. So they just send 3,000 because it's such an easy city compared to Jericho, right? But look what we read in Joshua 7, 4 and 5. But they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased Israel from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. So now I want you to think about this. Israel soundly defeated by this small city. They had 600,000 warriors going to Jericho. Nobody got injured. Nobody got killed. They go to this little town, 3,000. They're soundly defeated, and 36 men get killed. Do you understand 36 wives had no husband come home from battle? Do you realize 36 sets of parents had no son come back from that battle? They had 36 funerals. Okay, are you seeing this? So Israel's like, oh, Joshua gets on his face. The leader's, God, you've abandoned us. Right? Now, what's the natural tendency? I'm mad at God. Yeah. Have you ever seen Christians that are mad at God? You should never. Listen, learn this. Never be mad at God. If there's a problem, it's not on God's end. God's not the problem, okay? So they're all on their face. Like, God, you've abandoned us. See, we should have stayed back over in the desert. I mean, they're getting stupid now, okay? And God says to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned. He doesn't say Achan has sinned. He doesn't say a man in Israel sinned. He said Israel has sinned because we're one body. Are you seeing this? So, So they do this elimination process. God shows who the man is. And look what Achan says when he gets identified. It is true, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much, I took them. Achan knowingly disobeyed God. He knowingly sinned. Okay? Israel came under that kryptonite. They were invincible with Jericho. They get soundly defeated in a little town. Because of spiritual kryptonite. Mm. And what's so amazing, it's not just a man named Achan that suffers the consequences. It's the entire nation. Now, let's go back to Paul. If you look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, I'm going to show you. He says, for some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. Now he's talking about the Lord's Supper again, right? Mm. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. So what we've got here, and this is what the commentaries say, is the richer people were able to come in early and they ate all the foods and they left scraps for the poorer people. Because remember, it's a meal. It's not a ceremony like we do today. So the the sin here is they're disobeying what God had told them not to do. Right? Getting drunk, gluttony, covetousness. Are you seeing this? Then Paul goes, now, now notice it says, for some of you. Do you see that? Now keep reading. Let's come down here a little further. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ. Now, do you understand what he's saying? Without discerning the Lord's body. He's not talking about, when he says the body of Christ, he's not talking about the bread. He's talking about the body. Israel. You seeing this? You are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many, some of you, that is why many of you are weak, sick, and some have even died. Now, let me read to you from a very respected commentary called the Pilar New Testament Commentary. It should not be assumed that the sick or the dying were particularly guilty of the sin. But like most plagues of divine judgment, the plague could fall indiscriminately on the community as a whole. Are you seeing this? Yeah. All right. So, have you ever questioned... Why do we have so many mothers, single mothers in our churches that can't make ends meet? Mm. Why we have people dying so often in our churches prematurely? Mm-hmm. Why are there people that just can't get healed of sickness? Yeah. Yeah. In the book of Acts, they were laying the people on the streets and they were getting healed. Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> you know what it is? I, I, I'm, I'm pushing 60. I'm getting close to 60 years old. And I'm just fed up with not facing the truth. I love people enough. I want to see people free. I want to see our churches impact cities. And I'm asking questions now that we've all thought, but we've been afraid to ask. And I'm just not going to do it anymore. And and I, I, I pray 
that you hear the spirit of this, of what I'm saying. I pray that you understand we're trying to seek solutions here, not point fingers at people. Okay? We want solutions because we don't want to see kryptonite in the church. Right? So, could it be the practice, the practice sin of some is affecting the lives of many others today in the body of Christ? Let me give you another situation that Paul talks about with the same church. There's a guy that's living in known sin. He's sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother, right? And yet he says, I'm a Christian. I, am, I belong to Jesus. And Paul has a right to this church. And I want, I want to read to you four different verses in just 13 verses. This is a very short chapter, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. Paul said, you should remove this man from your fellowship. You must throw this man out. Here's another verse. Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. You must remove the evil person from among you. Four verses out of 13, Paul says remove him. Why? Because he's living in willful sin. He knows it's sin, but he still says, I'm a believer. Now, Paul says, hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. Don't even eat with people like these. He says, put them out of your fellowship. Don't even eat with them. He says, but, but what about the people who are lost? They're in the world. He says, oh, you should eat with them. Yeah. We should be going to their homes and yeah. eating lunch with them yeah. and, and playing basketball with them and, yeah. and, 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 and reaching out to them. But yeah. what Paul's talking about is a guy that says, I am a Christian, yet he is willfully disobeying God. Yeah. Yeah. You know what Paul says it's like? It's like yeast. What is yeast? You put it in the flour, and it spreads throughout all the bread and causes it to rise. Yeah. So what Paul's saying is, if you allow this kryptonite, yeah. this willful sin, known sin, practice known sin, it's going to spread through the whole congregation. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you're already seeing why many, you got the actions of some and why many, because kryptonite affects the community. Wow. Now, I do realize that there's probably some people going, wait a minute, are you telling me that my life's going to be affected by what other people are doing? Mm-hmm. Well, let's look at the days of Solomon were the days that the Bible says there wasn't one poor person. Everybody had their own home, their own garden. Nobody was even renting, okay? Yeah. They, 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 they had abundance. They had healthy yeah. people, right? That was the days of Solomon. What about the days of Elijah? Elijah was just as godly. As, as the godly people in the days of Solomon. But Elijah's having to eat foods from raven's mouths. Yeah. He's having to drink his water out of a river. Why? Not because of his sin, because of Ahab, because of yeah. Israel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because of their idolatry, because of their known sin. Elijah's not living the comfortable life that the people right. were living in the days of Solomon. Wow. So let's not, let's, let's not think of it like this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be positive. Yeah. Let's be the change. Yeah. That's good. You know, I, 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 why would I even bring this up? Okay, look, have you ever met, and, and I hopefully you'll understand what I'm talking about. You ever met a girl that, she's pretty wild, right? She's sowing her oats, right? wild oats, whatever, right? And then she gets married, and then she has a baby. And you notice all of a sudden this girl's not wild anymore. Why? Because she realized, uh-oh, I'm responsible for this baby now. I'm responsible for my husband. My, I, I can't be wild. My actions are going to affect my husband my baby. Why can't we behave like this in the church? Why can't we get a little bit bigger, broader minded of the body of Christ and sit there and say, hey, is my known sin going to be affecting others? Why can't we be the change? Do you see what I'm saying? You know, when I was when I was doing this, I um, I, I have a friend who. He's been 20 years a Navy SEAL, and he's not just a Navy SEAL, but he's a Navy SEAL instructor. And I know those Navy SEALs, man, they're so tight. They're so united. And I called him and I said, how do you, how in the world do you get a a platoon of 18 guys to be united like we see these Navy SEALs are? And you know what the first thing he said to me was? He said, John, the last thing, the last thing a Navy SEAL thinks about is himself. Mm -hmm. I said, what? He said, he thinks about his 17 other guys in the platoon. And he said, when you think about it, John, if you're looking out for yourself, you have just one person looking out for you. He said, but if you're... If you have 17 other guys looking out after you, wow. 
And then he started preaching to me. He said, John, if the church would just be like this, if we would stop looking out for ourselves and start thinking about, hey, my actions, my behavior, how's it going to affect all the other people in my community and the body of Christ around me? Be the change is what I'm saying. Right? Let's eliminate spiritual kryptonite. Yeah, maybe it's not, you're not directly affected by your known sin that you're in, but do you understand we're a body? And if my hand sins, my whole body reaps the consequences of it. If my hand steals, my whole body's going to jail. You know, they don't say, oh, we're going to cut off your hand and put your hand in the jail. The rest of you is fine. You didn't do anything. We are one body. We are one body of Christ. He's the head. He's the head. We're the body. It's real. And so I know this is really heavy stuff, right? But you know what? I really believe the Holy Spirit wants us to grow up. And not be like that girl sowing her wild oats, but let be like the mom who says, hey, let's take responsibility for my family. All right? We'll continue on this in the next lesson. 